Good morning, guys. So I have a question. How many of you have ever liked or still like watching TV series? Yeah? How about Korean drama? Yeah? More? You know, there's something about Korean dramas. You start one episode and then you cannot stop. Yeah? It's kind of like Pringles. Once you start eating, it's like, oh, wala na. I have to finish it. Have you ever experienced, you started this Korean drama and you started watching it, episode one, episode two. After a while, the plot, you don't, like, it loses its appeal, but you just want to know how it ends. Yeah? Sometimes movies are like that. I, wa- I recently watched a movie entitled Fallen. It's about these angels. It's a love story and all of that. It's one of the worst films I've ever seen. But I, no, no, no. It's, a, like, it's a, with teenagers. Uh, it's just entitled Fallen. It's one of the worst films I've ever seen, but I just wanted to know the ending. So I I suffered through watching the thing, like, how's this going to end? And then it ended cliffhanger, paparang, oh man, wow, I just wasted my life there. But you all know what I mean, right? There are certain things in life, you don't intend to really get hooked, but then you get hooked. And in the end, you just have to finish it, or you just want to know how it ends, even if you know you're wasting your time, it's not really good for you, bro. Yeah? And today we're going to talk about something like that, but in a more spiritual sense. Today we're going to talk about Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah. And Lot is a very interesting character. Um, when I saw the text, I said, okay, I want to do a character study on Lot. So I did a character study on Lot. I looked at the New Testament, and Peter calls him righteous. Righteous Lot. And I was thinking, wait a minute, is this the same Lot who was in Sodom and did some really funky stuff. I think it was. So I had to double check. It really is. So why did Peter call him righteous? So we're going to talk about Lot today, and this is going to be a long text, 30 plus verses for a very straightforward theme. And this theme is the progression of sin in our lives. So we trace Lot's life. How did Lot, how did we get introduced to Lot a few chapters back? Or if you want to go back in our uh, YouTube sermon series on, on Genesis, we first meet Lot as a, as a nephew of Abraham. During that time, Abraham was uh, still um, not yet super famous, not yet super wealthy. God had blessed him, but not as much yet. And yet, when he got super blessed by God, Abraham and Lot had an issue, right? The herds. There were too much animals, not enough green grass to feed everyone. The herdsmen were fighting with each other, you know, like, hey, I'm Abraham's uh, people, you're, you're Lot's people, and, you know, there's not enough room. And so Abraham told Lot, bro, we got to separate. You can't, we can't stay in the same place, so you get to choose first. Now, normally, since Abraham was the uncle, if you're the nephew, you're not supposed to choose the better place. It's like if you go to a birthday party and there's a birthday table and the birthday celebrant says, choose where you want to sit. You're not going to sit in the birthday chair, right? You're going to choose like some chair somewhere out there, you know. But what Lot did was he chose the birthday chair. He said, I'm going to stay where, where I know it's good for me. And uh, uncle, you know what, Uncle Abe, you, you go where you go. Like you just, you do you, all right? But I'm going to choose the best stuff. So Lot chose something that was selfish for himself. And then, because he chose that, remember the war happened, he gets abducted or kidnapped. And what did Abraham had to do? Abraham had to rescue the guy. And after the rescue, we, there's something we don't see. We don't see any kind of show of loyalty or gratitude from Lot. We don't see Lot go to Abraham and thank him. We don't see Lot um, offering anything in return or to at least show loyalty or whatever. He was just like, thanks for the save. Got to go. Bye. Then he left and he lived outside of Sodom. Now, everybody during their day knew what Sodom was. Sodom was a place where people would uh, practice the weirdest, most perverted, most wicked things. But Lot said, urban city, I'm an urbanite, you know, I ain't going to go into some farmland. I want the luxury life. So I'm going to live just outside the city, somewhere near. Okay? Now that's where we stopped in finding out about Lot. He was a single guy living outside Sodom. Uh, he chose some selfish things for himself, in, 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 in effect, disrespecting or even offending Abraham. And then last week, 
God and angels arrived and told Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom. It's going to be it's going to be ashes after I'm done with it. And Abraham interceded and he said, God, if there are 50, remember that, the bargaining scene? If there are 50 righteous people, will you destroy it? No. If there are five less than 50, and then God's like, okay, if there are 45, I won't destroy the city. Right? And then he bargains and bargains and bargains until uh, finally he says, okay, if there are 10, okay, if there's 10, I'm not going to destroy the city. And then they part ways. Abraham goes home. The angels now arrive in Sodom. And that's where we are today, Genesis chapter 19. Uh, we're going to go through the whole text. I'm not going to go through it word for word or, or verse for verse, but we're going to uh, give you the context of the story. So Genesis 19 verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, where was Lot? He was at the gate. You know who sits at the gate of cities during that time? The leaders of the city. So Lot went from an outsider to a citizen to now a leader of Sodom. How does that happen? And we know what Sodom did. We know the practices of Sodom and he was a leader? That's a little questionable. So now he was influential in the city. He was probably uh, uh, he probably used his wealth. Now Sodom was a very wealthy and progressive city during that time. If you think about Sodom before you could compare it to a bustling uh, growing city like maybe New York or something like that. Okay, so that's their level before. And Lot knew the depravity of Sodom. He knew that when night comes, the people would practice the worst stuff. That's why he was begging the angels, come to my house. Don't stay outside. Like, town square, are you serious? <laughs> come home. Like, come home with me. Like, in the house. Okay, so he was, he was trying to kind of save the angels from experiencing or witnessing the wickedness of the city. So he probably knows there's some sort of judgment coming here. All right? So at first, it sounds like he's trying to maybe do something good, right? But he kind of knows judgment is coming. Interestingly, Lot did for the angels what Abraham did. Remember? Abraham was also like, please, you know, let me serve you. Let me feed you. Same thing with Lot. But there's a difference. Abraham did all of these things from a place of peace and obedience. Lot was doing this from a place of compromise and disobedience. Big difference. And I'm sure we've all been there in a relationship with God. There are times when we obey God out of sheer joy, and there are times when we obey God while we're compromising. So it's kind of like, oh God, ano ha? Tawad ta ha? Like, okay, I'm gonna kinda obey you now, but could you like let me do this and that sin? We've all been there. We know what it's like. Look at verse 14, uh, verse 4. But before they lay down, so in the house now, they're now in the house of Lot. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out, went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. They said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. So what's happening here? The whole city, and you know, sometimes the Bible exaggerates uh, to make a point. Sometimes the Bible puts in details to explain to us what's really happening. And here, the Bible wants us to know that the whole city, even uh, it says here, young and old, okay? All the people to the last man, both young and old, surrounded the house. Young means 13 years old during their day. So imagine, 13 years old to the oldest in the city, surrounded the house, 
forgive the term, I'm going to say uh, some crude words, but they wanted Lot to bring the two angels out so they can gang rape the two angels. That's essentially what it is. Okay? And so Lot is saying, please don't do that. These are guests under my, my, my house. You take my virgin daughters, gang rape my daughters instead. Now what kind of situation or what kind of wicked depravity would you have in a city that those are your options? Give out these people who I think are angels or my daughters. Daughters na lang instead of heavenly beings. That's a little, I know it sounds extreme. It's a little difficult to imagine in our minds, especially if you have daughters or uh, if you've got uh, nieces who you, are, who you love, you're protective over them. Just the thought of it would cause you to cringe. But the city has become that bad. Now we think, does that really happen here today in the 21st century? Yes, actually. You just don't know it, but the world is a very cruel place. We have parents who sell their children to human traffickers or human abusers for profit, for gain. right? So they do it for even worse things. So the world today, the world before, not so different at all. We're just not as exposed or as informed or as in the know as these organizations who actually try to rescue uh, these uh, victims. So this was a very, very perverted place. The whole city was corrupted. They desired to do perverted things by force. Now, imagine the whole city is united for something wicked. It's not really that uncommon today, too. You've got the pride parades where the whole city unites to shout out what? Their pride in this or that. Uh, just recently, I looked at Facebook. There was the shout out your abortions. Like they're proud of it. Uh, you, you, you just go to Twitter. Twitter is so toxic. You know, so you see the wickedness of mankind on Twitter. right? So it's not as difficult to imagine. Not really. Just open your social media. No? Now, what happens in, in verse 8? The city has become so perverted that Lot had to offer his own virgin daughters to the people he actually knows. Can you imagine? These are neighbors. Like, I know you. I do business with you. You just bought some stocks from me or I just bought some food from your restaurant. Oh, by the way, here are my kids. It's like, how? So it's that bad. And in verse 9, when they say that he, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge, that's not an exaggeration. Like, are you judging me? That's not it. He's an actual judge because he's at the city gates. So they're saying, look at this guy. He came in and we made him judge and yet now he's preventing us from doing what we normally do. There's an implication here. The implication is, you know what we've been doing and you were okay with it the whole time. How come all of a sudden, just tonight, you say no? That's the implication. You've allowed us all this perversion all this time except now. So imagine a governor or mayor of a city who says, I'm Christian. Oh, by the way, you want to do all those perverted things? Go right ahead. So when finally he suddenly says, you know what, uh, I'm going to take my faith kind of seriously now and say no, everyone's going to be, but you drafted this law that it's okay. Right? That was the feeling of the citizens towards Lot. You allowed us all this wickedness, and why suddenly now you're backtracking, you're changing your mind, you're saying no. Of course, it's implied here that Lot kind of knows these are divine beings, there's probably judgment, we're probably in big trouble, so I'm just trying to spare uh, all of us, myself included, right? Now look at verse 10. But the men reached out their hands, these are the angels, and brought Lot into the house and with him and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now something that is interesting here is the angels, quote-unquote, forced saved Lot. The angels literally grabbed him and pulled him in, shut the door, and then miraculously blinded everyone else. So what's happening? This is not Lot um, being so righteous that he got saved. He was forced saved. He was trying to reason and compromise with these people. He was trying to, but you know, can we like 
uh, okay, from one sin, can I g- offer an alternative sin for you to do? He wasn't saying don't sin. He was saying here's a different sin. Do this instead. So that's not really a righteous way to handle things. And so the angels uh, pulled him aside. And then the blindness was a miraculous blindness. But it's so strange that the people wore themselves out groping for the door. Now think about this. How, how, quote unquote, bent are you to sin that a miraculous blindness doesn't cause you to get so scared and find a way home, but rather you're still trying to sin? Like, I want to sin so much, you blind me, I'm still going to do everything I can to continue in that original sinful plan I had. That's how decided they were to sin. And now we're starting to think, grabby these people. But you know, when I was studying this, I was like, hmm, that reminds me of the guy in the mirror. There have been times that I wanted to sin and God would do something to prevent me and I would still go at it and sin. And I said, Lord, I can relate with the people in Sodom more than I could with Abraham here. Well, Abraham's not here, but last week, you know? And so this miracle, this blinding miracle does not dissuade them from sinning. It just wears them out still trying to sin. It's also a miracle that Lot is still being saved. Like, if I were the angels, I would just talk to God and say, God, are you sure this guy too? For real? <laughs> you know, he was offering his own daughter. So what, just kick him out and then burn the whole city? But no, they pulled him in. So that's another miracle. Why would God show so much grace to this guy? Verse 14. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. In other words, they laughed him out. They laughed him out of the house. (laughs) Come, let's go. Let's let's save ourselves. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. See, uncle, such a joker. That's the response. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought him, as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. So if you think about it, why did the daughters, uh, sorry, why did the daughter's boyfriends laugh at Lot, at Uncle Lot? Because the truth of the matter is this. When you call yourself a Christian and you compromise and the world sees it, they're not going to take you seriously when you mean it. It's a boy who cried wolf. Right? Like, I'm a Christian. Really? You? (laughs) I was with you last week. You remember how we all both got wasted and we did all these crazy things? You're a Christian? They're not going to take you seriously. That's what happened with Lot. His testimony was so ruined. He came from being outside the city. Oh, your uncle is who? Abraham? The guy who worshipped Yahweh, right? This Yahweh God that we don't know. Yeah, that's my uncle. So you worship him too? Yeah, 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 I do. From there to leader of the city. Imagine the compromises he had to make. One after another, after another, after another. And how he ruined his testimony. One day, after another day, after another day. Sadly, the first appearance of Mrs. Lot is here. So we know he was single when he arrived in in Sodom. Now he's married. What does that mean? He married a Sodomite woman. Someone who is not worshipping Yahweh. Another compromise. And then the Bible says he lingered. Like if God, okay, if literally angels arrived and said, get out, we're destroying Cebu City now. Oh, we'll, we'll be rushing out. You're not going to be really, man, but I like, I, SMC Side City is right here. I like Ayala. Like, yeah, oh, no, no, you just, you don't even, can I go home and pack bags? No, 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 you just get out. Him lingering means he liked his lifestyle there. He got used to the comforts of compromise. And that's so deadly. He lingered, so he got forced saved once already. He lingers, so the angels grab him and force him out. So he gets forced saved take two. Right? He gets forced saved again. And the key there is, I love how the, the Bible says it here, the Lord being merciful to him. It's like saying, duh. 
<laughs> God had to really put that there to make it sink into our heads. The Lord is merciful. That's the key theme because we can be lot. We have a tendency to linger too. God says, this is a sin in your life. Let go. Repent. Okay, Lord, you're right. I will repent next week. I'm just going to see, see this through. I want to know how it ends. I know it's not good for me. I know it's wrong. I know it's more sinful than Korean teleseries dramas, but I just want to know how it ends. Just push through to the very end. Then maybe, yeah, we can be lingering like Lot. We also think, but I'm not that much like Lot, offering my own daughters. Well, one, I don't have daughters. So you know what? Really? Are we really not like him? Here's a question. We can linger. We can compromise. Is it possible for us also to offer our most precious blessings to the most deceptive tempta temptations? We have. We've all been there. Whatever was most precious at a certain point in our lives, that's what the enemy wants. And that's usually what we give up. The most precious thing is our faith. It's our relationship with Jesus. It's our love towards Christ. And yet that is the very thing that we always give to the Sodom city whenever we sin and disobey. That's always the issue. It's never this sin, that sin. No, no, no. It's always our relationship with Jesus every time, every moment, in every temptation. That's just the nature of temptation and how sin works. And in that sense, we can so relate with Lot. Verse 18, and Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. Can you imagine this? They grab him. They uh, supernaturally drag him out. So I can imagine like in my mind some sort of supernatural miracle thing, right? So they grab him by the hand and they maybe teleport him out of there or they, they f sort of run fly him out of there. I don't know. And they drop him far already. And they say, go to the hills. Look. Instead of saying, thank you, O lords, thank you for bringing me here. He says, oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found, has found favor in your sight and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. We'll talk about the whole little one in a bit. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the, of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Let's talk about this for a minute. Lot has the audacity to choose his punishment. And we've all been there. You know, when I was studying this, I was always thinking, that's so me. I have so much to repent of. You know, it's always, uh, I'm, I'm doing this sin. God says, okay, I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm not going to destroy you outright right here. But you repent and you go there. And I'll be like, Lord, okay, I repent. I'm sorry, but probably not there long. Can I still choose <laughs> where? That's Lot. And it's so strange because this is a punishment where he, he, he chose for himself everything up to this point, right? Abraham said, okay, where do you, where you, where do you want to choose to go? And he chose for himself. And then he went to Sodom outside. He chose for himself to enter the city. He chose for himself to become a leader of the city. All his choices up to now has led to this point of him losing everything that he has chosen for himself. And now he's still trying to choose. The hills have nothing. But there's a little city. It's like escape Cebu City. Oh, but there's seaside and Ayala Malls and all of that. Okay, fine. And God says, okay, go to the hills. I don't want the hills, God. Can I put it along somewhere like maybe Bohol or, you know, maybe a smaller city? So he still wants those comforts. He's still looking for the luxury lifestyle and the city comforts of living. He's still holding on to the same idol he's had from the very beginning. What was his idol? The comforts for me. Right now, that's still what he wants. And this is also a strange thing 
the reasoning that Lot has. He says, if I get to the hills, which is farther, I might not be saved. I'll stay na lang in this city which is nearer. I'll be saved here. Does that make sense to you? Logically, it doesn't, di ba? In fact, the angels confirm it. He said, okay, for you, we won't even destroy that city. So, in the original plan, even that city was, that little city was doomed as well. So, Lot chose a place of destruction. He still chose a, dis- uh, uh, he was still choosing suicide, essentially. And that's often how sin works. When we are so committed to sin, we become illogical, we become inconsistent, we become like people will say, that's insane. Why would you choose that? You know? Why would you go to the place where everybody can see it's bad for you? But the person obsessed with the sin will say, I know it's bad for me, but I'm still going to choose it. And then you make up all these weird reasons to stick with that sin. Illogical, inconsistent, irrational, but who cares? If I die, I die. I choose my little city. That's the nature of sin. People who justify sin often don't make sense, and it's frustrating And many times, when we choose our sin, we end up frustrating the people who love us the most. We end up disappointing, offending, you know, frustrating the people who genuinely do care about us as well. What what was Lot's sin? It has always been self-preservation and situational ethics. He had no real conviction. He only chose what was convenient at the time. What's convenient before? Choose Sodom. What's convenient now? Give the daughters. If I give the daughters, they won't harm the angels. If they won't harm the angels, city gets spared. I get to continue living my life here. You see, it wasn't really to repent. It was, I want to save my idol. I want the angels to spare this city so I can continue to live here. So here are the daughters instead. He was giving an alternative sin so he can live in, in his own sin. And that's another thing we have to learn about sin. When you're living in sin you will look for ways to justify the sins of others so that they will justify your own. In other words, let's encourage each other in sin. That's what the New Testament says as well, right? That in, especially in Romans, people will gather for uh, Romans and Timothy as well. People will gather uh, teachers who will scratch their itching ears to tell them what they want to hear. You're greedy. It's okay. God wants to bless you. Keep being greedy. You're selfish? That's fine. You know, you got to love yourself because God is love. So they twist the Bible, twist Scripture. That's just how sin works. And it's a very scary thing to think about. Lot also said this. After he said, is it not a little one, the, the small city? And he says, if I go there, my life will be saved. Your life won't be saved. So what he's saying is, this is my Savior. This idol is my functional Savior. And many times, it's not about heaven or hell. It's about save me, God, from blank. Whatever that blank is, save me from loneliness so I'll be with whoever in lang. Save me from prov- poverty so I'm going to steal. Save me from blank and then I'm going to sin to save myself from blank. So it's now a functional savior. The interesting thing is, the, in verse 23, it says, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. You know what that means? He lingered again. Because the city was supposed to be near. So the Bible saying the sun already rose. It's like it took you that long. It took you the whole night really to get there. Meaning you didn't rush. The angel said, go there quickly. Okay. La, di, da, di, da. <laughs> you know, he was probably thinking, man, sayang nga, oy, that place. Oh, man. my." That was the heart. It was not a heart of gratefulness. It was a heart of compromise the whole time through. He took his time dragging his feet towards Zoar. Now, interestingly, Lot's wife looked back and uh, she became a pillar of salt. Now, she was a Sodomite woman. She probably was born and raised in Sodom and so it was harder for her to not look away. Now, what is this? Some some scholars believe that the fire that came down from heaven, uh, it produced a kind of chemical reaction and she was probably rained down on with uh, liquefied or chemical sulfur. Okay, and so that can cause you to crystallize like salt. So it's not like literal, like the table salt you get. But you know how sometimes uh, some kind of chemicals form and then it crystallizes on the skin. So some scholars believe that's actually the scientific 
uh, way of describing it. She, she crystallized out of severe sulfuric heat. So that's like really scary judgment. Now look at verse 30. Now Lot went up out of Zoar, so he finally escaped. He's, in, is, he's already now in Zoar. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters. Didn't he want to avoid the hills and he wanted to be in Zoar? And now he left Zoar and now he's in the hills. Now look at what he said, uh, what the Bible says here. For he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old. And there is not a man on earth to come in to us and after the manner of all the earth, meaning we can't get married. Come, let us make our father drunk with wine, a uh, drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. So he was that wasted. So they made their father, uh, the next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn, the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Now, FYI, the Moabites and the Ammonites, if you study the history of Israel, these two people were enemies of Israel throughout the whole history. There are some Moabites and Ammonites who do repent, but for the most part, the whole people have been against Israel ever since. But going back to the text itself, what happened here? Now you're thinking, first, cringe, second, ew. But why? Remember before, if you were, not, if you were a, a single woman, uh, who, who's getting along in years and you're not married and you don't have kids, you're going to panic before. Because before, women didn't have the same opportunities, the same jobs, the same career uh, uh, opportunities or doors that would open to them as before in an in a agricultural culture and all of that stuff. Okay, So they panicked. So what did they do? Their father practiced situational ethics. Nothing is right or wrong as long as you get what you need and what you want for now. So... Just follow dad's example. We use situa situational ethics too. And just as he was going to use us to keep his lifestyle of comfort, why don't we use him? He was going to do to us anyway. You know, he, was, he didn't value our purity or chastity. Why should we? Do you see how the sin transferred? How the daughters learned from their dad all the worst stuff. And now they're in a cave. They had nothing. They started with nothing. They made choices that were selfish, or Lot made choices that were selfish for himself, and now he ends up with nothing. Why did he fear living in Zoar? Because he had no money. When he left Abraham's side, he had money. So when he went to Sodom for the first time, he had money that he could use to buy influence, to become a leader. Now he's got absolutely nothing. Everything's ash, because God destroyed his, all his properties. So now he can't use anything to influence anyone, so he's in a cave. His daughters inherited the worst values from their father. And Lot would have been so drunk to not remember anything. The Bible here says it, right? He did not know. He didn't know what happened the night before or the night before that. Now, what would you say about the spiritual state of a person who gets so drunk, so wasted, he couldn't remember a thing? That's probably bad enough. What would you say about his condition if that happens to him twice in a row? Then it's really bad. Meaning, he didn't mind getting wasted over and over again. So he was in a state of, we don't know, dejection, depression, maybe gave up hope. Maybe We don't know. We don't really know. Uh, Lot would have been so drunk two days in a row, his spiritual condition would have been really, really bad. Um, and there's an interesting thing uh, that I skipped. There's an interesting text that I skipped. I'm going to go back to it. It's in verse 27 to 29. I skipped it intentionally because I wanted to bring this up. If you think of Lot first, you would think that he was so parang, is he really Christian? Is he really saved? Why would Peter call him righteous Lot? Well, look at his life. 
And that's really the last that we know of Lot. That's how it ends. Character study, that's how the story ends. Huh? He's, we, we get introduced to him, he does some really bad stuff, and then he goes from bad to worse to worse to worse. And then in the end, his daughters do to him what he was going to do f- towards his daughters anyway. Righteous Lot. And verse 27 is the key. In the middle of all this, verse 27 says, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. So remember where Abraham interceded for Sodom? He was so concerned, he actually went to, it's probably a mountaintop or a cliff, and he's looking towards Sodom, and he's thinking, did God spare? Was there actually 10? Was there really 10? And if you count, there's probably, what, one? Righteous Lot. It didn't say Righteous Lot and Mrs. Lot and the daughters. It's just Righteous Lot, so one. So imagine Abraham standing there, And the Bible says he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley and he looked. So he's probably thinking, please let there not be smoke. And what did he see? And behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So here's the guy who loves Lot, prayed for Lot, interceded for Lot, negotiated with reverence with God for the people and for Lot. But look at verse 29. So it was that uh, so it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Why did God save Lot? Why did Peter call Lot righteous? It was not because of Lot. It was for the sake of Abraham. God said it here in the Bible. God remembered Abraham. That's why he saved Lot. Forced saved Lot. Now if we really think about it, if we're to summarize this whole thing, that's you and me. God, quote unquote, forced saved us from our sin, changed our heart of stone, made our hearts into hearts of flesh for the sake of Christ. Not because we're righteous, not because we're so cool, so good, No, none of those. God saves us for the sake of Christ because Christ interceded for us the way Abraham interceded for Lot. So now Lot, if you read Lot, ah, righteous Lot, is the same thing that people can say about you and me. Huh, David, righteous? Are you kidding? I know this guy. Have you met him in college? Are you kidding? (laughs) Pag sure. But it's God's mercy. And this this story, as scary as it is about sin, It's also really a a story about, the yes, the greatness of the badness of sin, but also the greatness and the goodness of God and the mercy of God as well. And this is really where the gospel shines. If we're to summarize the whole thing, we'll just summarize the whole thing. If you think about it, Lot had the same sin from the very beginning to the very end. It was urban comforts. If I'm going to entitle the sin, it's urban comforts, right? But the sin got greater in gravity and greater in scope and it crept into his heart since day one. How he lived it through the years. Now think about this for a moment. I'm sure you know this. There's some sins in your life. It started really small. It just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger and you feel like it's out of control. Diba? If we already know that from experience, if we already know this from experience, why start entertaining a new baby sin? when we know what that baby will turn into when it becomes a big sin. Lot began by disrespecting Abraham, went outside Sodom, went inside Sodom, went to be the leader of Sodom, married a Sodomite. Even in punishment, he's still looking for his idol, the small city. Even when God is disciplining him, he's still... Like, if if Abraham is negotiating with God to save people... Lot is negotiating with God to save his sin. Isn't that kind of weird? We're supposed to negotiate to save for God to save sinners. We're not supposed to negotiate for uh, for God to allow us to save our own sins. And yet, that's what Lot has done. In the end, he lost everything. He lost his integrity. He even quote unquote lost his daughters in a sense. You really think his daughters had any respect for him left at all after this? Can you imagine the daughters? in the house and the people are banging on the door shouting bring them out and so they close the doors and the daughters are in the house and Lot says people citizens of course the daughters can hear he's shouting so everyone can hear 
So he's screaming at the top of his lungs. Don't do this. I've got two daughters. Imagine the daughters, huh? Looking at each other. Is that serious? Let me bring them out to you. Like, oh no. Is this for real? They lost all their respect for their dad. Why? He wanted his sin. The Bible does warn us about sin. Romans 7.23, Paul says that our, 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 our lives should wage war against sin. We have to declare war against our sin. Matthew 7, Jesus warns us. There are people who will say, Lord, Lord. I always translate that for the 21st century. Uh, Jesus said, on the last day, many will come to you and say, Lord, Lord, did we not attend Bible studies in your name? Did we not lead Bible studies in your name? Do discipleship in your name? Go to church in your name? And the Lord said, away from me, you workers of sin. I never knew you. You never loved me. You loved your sin. You negotiated with me so you can continue sinning. That's the point. First John Actually, the whole First John, you read the whole thing. It's just one gigantic warning. He who says he's in the light, but yet what? Continues in sin or hates his brother, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He is still in darkness. Okay? These are people who are blinded and still groping, trying to sin while blinded. So the literal event in Sodom is a spiritual event for many people who are spiritually blind and yet still groping in the dark towards sin trying to sin all their might. James 1 verse 5 says, tells us the progression of the baby sin. It grows up, leads to death. How, how do we know this? Or how, how can we assess ourselves? And here's how I, always, uh, how I always look at it. Hebrews says, Hebrews 12 is one of my life verses. Hebrews 12 says, that the, the word of God, the scriptures, is living and active, sharper than, an, than a double-edged sword. It pierces through what? Bone and marrow. And in the end, it exposes the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What does that mean? Exposes the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What does that mean? Here's what it simply means in practical application. Practical application. I don't really care if a person talks about Jesus all the time. I don't care if he's like super, super like spiritual. He knows theological terms. He, he's very like articulate with theology. I don't care about that. I don't even care if this person is very moral. If this person is like Mahatma Gandhi level or Mother Teresa level of, of good, that doesn't matter to me. Here's what matters to me. When the scriptures address an area of his life that is sinning and he rejects that, that's where his heart is. Let me make a very simple example for that. I'm married. You know my wife. Now let's pretend for a moment that you saw me going on a date with a girl that's not her. So you approach me. Bro, uh, I kind of saw you uh, and you were on a date and it was really, really bad. Like, you can't deny it, bro, because I saw you holding hands and da-da-da-da-da. And then I tell you, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you saw that. I get it. I get it. But you don't know how we do church on Sundays. You don't know the Bible studies I do. And let me explain to you covenant theology, new covenant theology, and la 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 Would you care about all that? No. What if I said, but you haven't seen the 364 days of the year that I was faithful. You know, don't focus on this one day. Nope. That's what it means. When the scripture addresses an area of your life and you reject that, the thoughts and intentions of your heart is exposed. That is how the word of God is living and active. In this case, the angels brought the word of God to Lot. Literally the word of God to Lot, right? Get out. No. Thank you, but no. Oh, man, I have to leave. You go to the hills. Uh, well, can, can I stay in the city? And that's what we do, too, in our own ways. You see, in the end, sin is a deadly force. It is scary. It is dangerous. It is something we must repent of. But at the same time, we also see the grace of God. We see that Despite the disobedience of Lot, God, quote-unquote, forced, saved him. Now, we are not saying here, what we're not saying here is that, well, God forced, saved Lot. I can continue sinning and God will just force, save me. Thank you, Jesus. That's not how it works. Why? Before, that's what happened with Lot because the Holy Spirit did not indwell Lot. 
Secondly, this is simply an illustration of how merciful God is, but this is not a justification for how sinful we can be. Okay? Again, it's an illustration of how merciful God is, but it is not a justification for how sinful we can be. We must still look at what the whole Bible tells us about sin, that we must repent of our sin, we must turn to the Lord, we must strive to fight against sin and to obey. Not because, you know, oh, we're so afraid God will, you know, turn us all into salt and we'll all be quote-unquote salty, but rather it's because God is gracious. And it is out of sheer gratitude, humility, and thankfulness that we serve the Lord. Now, let me end with this. I know it's a heavy sermon, big text, one thought. And here's the thought. Think of your life. You know that game, like the first thought in your mind, that's it? That, that game, like if I say like, you know, word, word association, yeah? Okay. Play that game with yourself, but just one word or one phrase. What's the baby sin that's growing in your life? The first thought. Don't, don't justify. Don't think, well, maybe it's not because, not just, just the first one. What is it? The baby sin that's growing or has already grown in your life. Whatever that is, that is this, the equivalent of Lot's deadly sin. For Lot, it was city comforts, city living, luxury living. What's yours? Whatever it is, kill it. You need help, talk to one another, talk to fellow mature Christians, confess your sins, ask for prayer, ask for accountability, and guess what? There cannot be any judgment when we talk about our sins and confess our sins to one another. Why? Because we all have our own baby sins. And all these baby sins are all deadly. And so we have to help one another fight each other's baby sins for one another. And of course, for the glory and the sake of Jesus himself. Right? So no room for judgment, but instead encouragement. Help one another. Pray for one another. Be accountable to one another. Be transparent to one another. It will take so much courage, humility to actually admit, here's my baby sin. It's actually a teenager now. Or here's mine, adult. Well, my sin is senior. Okay? Well, my sin is now so senior, it's like immortal, I think. I don't know how to kill it. I need help. You know, so we don't know how old the sins are in our lives, but we have to don't give up. Don't be like Lot who hides in a cave and just gets drunk na lang. Don't give up. The Holy Spirit, the, God promises the Holy Spirit will indwell us so we can fight that sin. I just recently listened to a sermon by Steve Lawson. The title of the sermon, Holy, Holy, Holy. You can already guess where he took the text from, Revelation. And he talks about the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin compared to the holiness of God. And I said, Lord, what timing? I'm doing laundry, listening about holiness, and then I study about Lot. Ooh la la. A really painful thing to do. But we have to do our own self-examination as well in these areas of our lives. So play that game in your head. What's your baby sin? What's the first thing that pops into your head? That's probably it. Because that's what your heart will try to grab and say, oh, no, no, don't let me go. Like, okay, that's really it. Repent of it. How? Going to the Lord. Asking for mercy, asking for grace, asking for supernatural, uh, divine interference from God to change your heart about that sin. It might come in a form of a revelation, an understanding of a verse or a text, studying the Bible, or maybe it will come after praying or whatever, but, or talking to a friend, talking to a fellow Christian, getting prayer from a Christian, hearing that another Christian said, you know, that was my baby sin. I killed it when it was a teenager. So if I could kill it, you could kill it. Because Christ is the same Jesus in me, or Holy Spirit that's in me, is the same Holy Spirit that's in you. And then just that hope. Now, you fought it and won with the Holy Spirit? Yes, there's hope. Maybe that just that can help. But you got to hear it from someone else. We don't know how. But we have been given, the, we've been equipped by Scripture on what we're supposed to do with it. Amen? Let me pray for everyone.